question comes in with the cultural emphasis on politics as the answer to the problems, what are some thoughts on how to flip these conversations to the real answer to Christ? I think we've always got to press behind whatever people think the question is to the question that's behind the question. And uh, so ultimately, if someone's against human trafficking, why? If that's the issue, why? What, why would that be wrong? Why, why, are, why are human beings of any worth? Why, why do we have a moral obligation to one another? Why? And you can always get the conversation back to someone looking at you with a look on his or her face in sheer annoyance that you're making them answer these questions or even think about them. But the reality is that's what we do. We just keep pressing the things back. Why? We're two-year-olds. Why? 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 Because the further we press back with why, the closer we get to the fundamental questions. And, and so when I meet people, regardless of what they tell me their position is on an issue, I just always ask the question, why? And then I keep pressing. And uh, I, think, I think that's, uh, well, you might say that's presuppositionalism. Well, yes, it's, it's, it, at least in part, it's, it's rooted in that, but it's also classical apologetics. It's just making people give answers and you just press back. Making, making people think. And uh, I'm sort of an election junkie. I've always uh, loved to sit up late watching election returns come in. I found out it's easier to sit up late watching election returns come in in California than in Florida. Um, but what you quickly discover as an election junkie is that uh, the day after the election, a campaign has been begun for the next election. And um, one thing we can say to people who are really worried about politics or avid about politics is, have you ever thought that there is some stability beyond politics? Um, that there is some resting place, some certainty, some assurance? And if you're worried, I think a lot of people are worried. What's happening to the republic? And uh, what we can assure them of is there's someone in charge. There's someone who knows what he's doing and that uh, we can look beyond all of the ebb and flow of the moment to, uh, if I were a Calvinist, I'd say a greater election that is stable. Amen. I, I talked uh, just this week about the fact that uh, for many on the left, politics has become religion. Uh, and uh, in a secular age, you see the secular left increasingly unsecular. They're just politicizing, uh, they're making a religion uh, out of their politics. Uh, my warning is that that can happen to conservatives too if we're not careful. Uh, we can treat politics as far more important uh, than a Christian ought to think. Uh, you can think of it as far less important than a Christian ought to think. But if, if we despair or think that the kingdom has arrived based upon an election, then we are, uh, we're, we're making politics religion. We ought to be warned of that. Dr. Nichols, a question came in. What are the qualifications that Ligonier used to define evangelicals in the state of theology survey? In other words, how do we come up with that definition of evangelicals? That's a great question. You can go to the stateoftheology.com for that survey and you'll see the numbers. Uh, there were 3,008 people surveyed, and of that 3,008, and I'm going from memory here, I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 800, thereabouts, are labeled evangelical. So that's that demographic category. For that survey, which was conducted by LifeWay, uh, which is the uh, research arm of the Southern Baptist Convention and a well-respected research arm, uh, we partnered with them to carry out that part of the survey. For that survey, it's a self-identifying label. But what we also have in the survey, it's 34 statements that you have to respond to. The last four were supplied by the National Association of Evangelicals, which took what was an old, uh, from David Bebbington, historian, the so-called quadrilateral to define evangelicals, took that fourfold quadrilateral and turned it into statements with some slight revisions. And so there's both a self-identifying label and then an actual litmus test, as you will. And it's biblicism, the authority of scripture, it's conversionism, the necessity of a new birth, it's also crucicentrism, 
the necessity of Christ's atoning death on the cross, and then an activism, the idea of being active in faith. And the sort of slight twist that that fourth question put to it was, not only must we know the gospel, but we must be active in sharing the gospel. So we're talking about this as both a self-identifying label and a bit of a litmus test. But all of you all have talked about this many times. This is a very difficult label, evangelical. And it's one of those labels that the more elasticity that gets applied to it, eventually it's going to snap, or it's going to be so elastic that it just sort of loses its, its, its identity. And that's what we're seeing. It's been alluded to numerous times, that reductionism uh, of just trying to get to the lowest common denominator and reduce and reduce and reduce. Um, that makes this label very difficult. And then you throw into the mix the political use of it at election time. Now it gets even more difficult. Uh, but back to the survey, it's a self-identifying, but also a litmus test. I'm a millennial, and many of my friends and acquaintances do not believe attending church is important to their walk with Christ. How would you respond to their erroneous thinking? Uh, Christ died for the church, Acts 20, and Christ is the head of the church, and every believer has been placed by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. It's totally unimaginable that someone for whom Christ has died and someone who has been placed into the universal church would not be a participant in the local church. Um, there's just really not even a theological category for that. So as one who pastored a church for 34 years, um, I think that that would call, serious que uh, call into account serious question about that person's um, personal relationship with Christ, uh, meaning do they even know the Lord? Um, because First uh, John says one of the tests that you have been truly born of God is that you love the brethren. And if you're not a part of a local church, um, you're a very selfish person. Um, and you love yourself. And you want to do what you want to do rather than giving your life um, in service and ministering to those who are a part of a local church. That's God's design for Christianity. There's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christianity. Uh, that is so um, foreign to New Testament Christianity, it, it's antithetical to New Testament Christianity. So I, I can't even imagine someone um, who's a true believer in Jesus Christ, um, who does not want to be a part of a local church, and further, who is, who is actually not a part uh, of a local church, uh, unless, of course, circumstantially hindered, being, for example, in a rest home and not able to, to physically c come to church. Um, but I think it seriously calls into account... Um, the genuineness of their salvation, uh, to not want to be a part of a local church. Therefore, you're not wanting to sit under the preaching of the Word of God, which is the primary ordinary means of grace. Uh, you're not wanting to uh, worship God in a corporate setting, um, and, and you're not wanting to give to other people. Uh, as God has designed it in a, in a local church family. So, um, you know, Hebrews 10 says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves, um, as is the practice of some. And I would say those some are those who did not come all the way to Christ, who trample underfoot the precious blood of Christ, who insult the spirit of grace, um, and show themselves to be apostate. Does attendance at a same-sex wedding imply acceptance of same-sex marriage? Yes. Yes, because you need to recognize that uh, 
attendance at a wedding, those who are in attendance are considered to be the celebrating uh, party. Uh, so, I mean, that, that made very clear, for instance, in the Book of Common Prayer, which is the order of weddings that's most familiar in church weddings in the United States. If there be anyone here who knows any reason why these two should not be lawfully wed, let him speak now or forever hold his peace. I think that should answer the question. It doesn't answer the question of how you handle this in friendships and in family. It just simply says that uh, you are there to say this is right. And, you know, if you go and you don't hold your peace, that would be an interesting headline story. <laughs> but I, I, don't, I don't think that's what you're going to do. And so I think Christians are looking for a way. And, and, and look, it's not just a wedding ceremony. It's also... Yeah, you know, there's the entire celebration of the wedding, it, it, and we don't know exactly what it means in every situation. When you have next door neighbors, how do you, how do you relate to them? How do you show Christ's love? How do you, how do you, how do you act grounded only in truth? Uh, how do you have a conversation? How do you build a relationship? So there are a lot of interesting questions there. But to me, uh, the wedding ceremony is a very easy question, simply because even of the language that is invoked, and in the history of the Book of Common Prayer. The, the, the reality was that if you stayed, you were a, so long as you lived, a testifier to the fact that they were lawfully wed. Let what God has put together, let no man put asunder. Um, so it, if, if it's just, if it's attending or not a ceremony like a swearing in, that's one thing. That's not what this is. This is the covenant of marriage being claimed here. You either believe it is or it isn't. What law did Christ obey for his active obedience? Adamic, Mosaic, moral law, other? All of the above. Um, yeah, so there was an original covenant of works given with Adam which required perfect, perpetual, personal obedience and uh, that is in some way echoed in the law of Moses. Uh, that's a big discussion, but in some way echoed in the law of Moses, um, summarized in the moral law, uh, and Christ fulfilled it all. Um, not only the moral law, but the ceremonial law, and um, all the equity of the civil law of, of Israel. So uh, at, at every point as, echo, as law echoes through the scripture, Christ obeyed it all perfectly. At what point does God create a person's soul and join it to a physical body? Is there a traditionist here? Are you? Did you hear that confession? Um, the distinguished Dr. Moeller has confessed himself to be a traditionist close. Almost, almost persuaded. I think it's most consistent in the same way that we understand the federal head, headship of Adam. Um, I think that's the easiest, most consistent way to understand that. Uh, but it doesn't answer, the problem is it doesn't particularly, I, I'm trying to avoid saying what it means. That'll save us a lot of time. Uh, and, and help keep you all from error. Uh, I mean, if they don't know what we're talking about. So why don't you define the terms? <laughs> well, classically and historically, there were two approaches to the creation of the soul. The creationist view that said God immediately creates the soul at the conception or some such beginning moment of the body. Fertilization. We, we, mean, we don't mean conception the way... And you don't mean conception the way modern doctors speak of it. You mean when God says, let there be life. Yes. Whatever you say. I... <laughs> and the alternative point of view historically, all the way back into the ancient church period, was the traditionist, or that the soul is passed from the father in particular, the parents into the... So is the soul immediately created in the new life, or is the soul in some way passed from the parents to the child? That's exactly right. And there's no, there's, there, there, there is no clear biblical answer to this. And the traducianist basically doesn't have an answer to the question when. 
other than the same thing as the creation is when God says, let there be life. But the question is, what's prior to that? And uh, I, I like the symmetry uh, and the theological pattern of understanding the tie between the federal headship of Adam and that we are all of Adamic seed and understanding from whence comes the soul, which is the first question answered by traditionism is from whence, not when. The, the, the complicating factor comes along with the doctrine of original sin. So if God immediately creates the soul, is he immediately creating a sinful soul, which would be impossible? So how does the sin get attached to the soul? If You're asking the wrong man. Well, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm just showing my broad-mindedness. Um, <laughs> but the creationist response is the soul is an undying spiritual creation of God that cannot be created by dying creatures. So it's complicated. There's, I think, not a really clear answer in the Bible or yeah. in, in convincing theological discussions of these things. And that's why the discussion and the difference of opinion continues. The really important thing to remember is we all have a soul. So Amen. don't lose... Never lo in, in the midst of really interesting theological discussion, never lose a hold of the fundamentals. Um, Amen. In our non-judgmental age, how do we defend God's goodness in instances of His justice in the Bible? Uh, we need to recognize, by the way, it's a very important issue here, that the most cogent, powerful uh, anti-theistic arguments being made right now are moral arguments, not rational arguments. And that's a shift in apologetics from where uh, in the early 20th century, your Bertrand Russells and uh, logical positivists and people like that said, you know, there's not enough intellectual, um, uh, there aren't enough sufficient intellectual grounds to believe in the existence of God. Now it is, you believe in God that's immoral, um, and especially the God of the Bible. And, you know, it's not as if God doesn't answer that question in the scriptures. He's not going to answer human beings. Uh, he's going to display his character, and, uh, and, and, and only at the end of history will everyone understand uh, the, the judgment and justice of God. In the meantime, we who are believers, just as Israel in the Old Testament and the church in the New Testament, have to understand that the God who is right is just, and uh, he who reigns over all the earth is just, and whatever he does is just. Our concept of justice is derivative and corrupt. Uh, we have it because God is just, and He's given us in His image an understanding of justice, but we would not act justly if justice were entrusted to us. We have to trust that God acts totally, perfectly justly, because justice is His. And uh, who is the grasshopper to complain of the justice of the Creator? Um, but that, that, that's what we're looking at here. Uh, and, and we have to confront these arguments head on. But ultimately, there is no rescue from the Bible. You know, we believe in every single word of the Bible, and that means that whatever God does is just, and if you can't handle that, you just can't handle that. Uh, but this is, this is the issue. Then, then where was the justice on the cross? You, you want to look at injustice? Well, Where's the justice from that human perspective in that he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us in order that in him we might be the righteousness, become the righteousness of God? Um, the, the, you know, God's justice is so perfect that those who come to faith in Christ are saved. And his justice is so perfect that anyone who does not will suffer eternal punishment. The Old Testament conquest of Canaan this is where Christopher Hitchens, one of the uh, four horsemen of the new atheism, uh, now dead, uh, but uh, Christopher Hitchens said, you know, I don't understand the theological liberals who say they want to get rid of the Old Testament and that vengeful, bloodthirsty God of the Old Testament and just cling to sweet Jesus. He said, I have to wonder if theological liberals have read the book of Revelation. And there's enormous truth in that. If you don't like the book of Judges, you're going to hate the book of Revelation. 
where he comes with a sword in his, coming from his mouth and will come to rule with a rod of iron. And that chapter ends with what makes Canaan look like a preschool Sunday school party. If God is just, then it is right, and he is just, and it is right. Let me just uh, add something here. In terms of how we think about God's attributes, I think sometimes we need to guard against pitting them against each other. It's very easy to do that with justice uh, versus mercy or wrath and love. And one of the great doctrines of God is the simplicity of God, that he is not a being that is composite, and we see this even, you know, reflect on this. Go back to this wonderful scene where Moses is asking to see the glory of God. And, and if you look at that, what God tells Moses is, I will let my goodness pass by you. And then immediately we have God saying, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will harden whom I will harden. And there they are put right together in this one being of God. So, so as you wrestle with these things and think through these things, just be careful to maintain that simplicity of God and not pit uh, these attributes or the God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New Testament. It's a horrible thing to do. Don't pit these things against each other. Or the fact that God's justice is somehow a negative thing, whereas mercy is a positive thing. Uh, that, 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 that's an insult to God. His justice and his mercy, again, they're the, they're the same because he is one. But to fail to call for God's justice is to fail to, uh, to honor and worship the one true and living God. And I, I think when um, people are pressing us on that point, it's appropriate to press back and ask them, do they believe that in human experience, there are wicked, evil acts that deserve punishment. Um, and most people are not so depraved as to deny that. And uh, uh, one of the few good things that could be said about the Nazis is they give us a great example of where most people will agree there were egregious, wicked acts that had to be punished. Um, well, if there are egregious, evil acts in history that have to be punished, then who gets to say what are the evil acts that have to be punished? And if there is a God, he gets to say. And that's, I, I think, a line of argument we have to press that taking the moral high ground by the secularist is ultimately inconsistent because they can take the moral high ground that they are taking only if they ultimately deny there are any evil acts that ought to be punished. I have been assaulted with troubling thoughts to the point that I have begun to doubt my salvation and the Lord's love for me. I don't know why now, after walking with the Lord over 35 years, I don't know more what more I can do but stay in God's Word and prayer, but they persist. Please help. Well, I would say, first of all, um, 1 John 5, 13, these things I've written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Um, it is God's um, gift to true believers that they have the assurance of their salvation. Um, the Holy Spirit who convicts of sin and who calls us into relationship with Christ, who um, regenerates us, is the very same Holy Spirit who gives the assurance of salvation. Assurance is an inside job by the Holy Spirit, and it really does not come from a pastor or an, a parent or an evangelist. It comes from the Holy Spirit, ultimately. Uh, there are external evidences of assurance of salvation, which is a changed life, um, but there is the inward witness of the Holy Spirit from Romans 8. I, th I think those who would doubt their salvation and doubt the love of God usually comes from someone who's not sitting under the regular systematic preaching of the Word of God, that the truth that they so desperately need to hear that God uses to bring the assurance of their salvation, uh, they have been sitting under such a weak uh, presentation of the truth that they don't really have the anchor for their soul that they should have. So obviously not knowing who wrote this question and not knowing where they go to church, but 
um, as someone who has, has pastored and, and met with untold numbers of people about the, their assurance of salvation, um, I have found that more times than not, it's because they're not under the preaching of the Word of God. And it, it, their, their soul, their heart lacks um, the strength that is provided by the Holy Spirit through the medium of the Word of God. So there are many other things that could be said from that. I think you need to know um, by what basis does anyone have assurance of salvation. And it's certainly in an understanding of the finality and the sufficiency of the death of Christ upon the cross um, to take away all sin uh, in the life of the one who believes. And there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It would be unbelief um, to reject that. It, it is true saving faith to accept that. And, and then also with that, as I just mentioned, uh, there, there is the evidence of a changed life. And First John gives like nine evidences of the one who has been born of God. And everyone who is born of God, um, there, these evidences, these, these changes will be seen in a life to such an extent, there's no way that anyone could pull this off on their own. This is, this is a work of God. There is no explanation but that God did it in a person's life. And if you don't see the evidence of a changed life, then you have serious reason to, to, to question the validity of your conversion. Uh, because not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And again, not to even know who wrote the question and not to know any of the background. Nevertheless, as a pastor, um, for 34 years, most people who came and asked that question were people who did not have faith in Christ. And so I was not quick to rush in and say, oh, no, 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 we all know you're saved, um, because that's not always the case. And, and, it, and more times than not, in my experience, of course, I was in the deep south where everybody's saved. And you have to get someone lost before you can get them saved. Um, they needed to come to the realization that just because they grew up in church or walked an aisle or something like that, that doesn't mean you're in. And in a genuine new birth experience, God the Holy Spirit gives assurance of salvation. So even with a question like that, and there may be others here who can identify with that, I, I think it's a soul-searching question. But let me say, I don't think you should search your soul over that alone. And that's the limits of a question and answer period like this. We can answer theological questions. We can answer pastoral questions generally. But I would say to this dear soul, find a godly pastor who can examine the whole of your doubts, the whole of your life, the whole of your faith, and really lead you to the promises of Christ and to life in him. So... Uh, it's, it's absolutely true that doubts sometimes arise because you're not converted, but Ursinus in his commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism, when he gave evidences of true faith, said the first evidence of true faith is doubt. And, and he meant by that that by and large in the world people don't doubt their salvation if they're not connected to salvation in some way. William Perkins said a desire for grace is an evidence of grace. So this is a delicate spiritual issue, and I, I urge you to find some wise Christian, preferably a, a wise, faithful pastor who can really talk this through and uh, decide what is the problem. Uh, is the problem a lack of assurance or a lack of faith? And uh, help you resolve sure. the problem. And, and some people are um, obsessive compulsive in their personality and temperament, and everything has to be perfect. And they kind of go through life, it's hard for them to accept certain things. And there are personality issues um, that come to the surface. But just to even follow up on, on what you said, 
yes, you need to talk to a spiritual leader, whether it's a pastor or an elder or a, a teacher. But at the end of the day, that man cannot say you're saved. At the end of the day, that's a work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of someone. And the pastor can only ask diagnostic questions and, and help frame the picture. Uh, but at the end of the day, the God who saves is the God who gives assurance. I don't always pick the order that these questions come up in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just remember, we have a lot more to get to. And this could be, this could be a long conversation. Are our children saved? Or will they go on their own journey? The Bible says, you and your house will be saved. Yes and no. <laughs> Paul said your children are holy if you're a Christian. Um, I believe, uh, and my church officially teaches, that uh, holy children dying in infancy are elect and saved. So if you're worried about children dying in infancy, uh, I think those holy children are saved. Uh, as children grow up, and um, we may have some slight differences of opinion on this point, uh, as children grow up who are children of the covenant um, and have been marked with the seal of the covenant, uh, they are holy. Um, unless they reject the covenant in unbelief. And so our, our duty as parents, I believe, is always to be calling our children to faith, just as ministers are always calling all of us to faith. Uh, our, our job as parents is not in the first place to encourage doubt in our children. Uh, it's to encourage faith in our children and to call them to live as the holy children of God. But some of the brothers may see things differently. They'll be wrong, but you should still listen to them. <laughs> oh, we're gonna to have to decide how much we wanna talk about this, brother. Uh, so, uh, I am a Baptist, and uh, that's not a surprise, that's not a press release. And uh, this is a conversation that goes on, but I believe that the child is receiving covenant promises through Christian parents that explain that the child rightly raised by Christian parents is raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord that comes with spiritual benefits. But that the child is a sinner who must make a positive confession of Jesus Christ as Savior and must be converted, um, genuinely converted, and that's why we disagree about baptism well, in no small I, matter. I, I, yeah. I agree with what you just said. It, that, it, it didn't that sound it like what you said was conversion, but rather just not rejection of the gospel. Well, I think both those things can work together. I don't think they have to be set at odds with one another. But I don't think you should raise a child in a Christian home and say, you're not a Christian because you haven't been converted yet. I don't think that's the way to talk to our children. I think the way to talk to our children is you need to be loving Jesus. You need to be tr trusting Jesus. You need to be resting in Jesus. I, I do talk that way to my children. Um, well, but I, I do, I, 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 and I, I, I do without hesitation. I, I also want them never to remember a time when they were not taught to love Christ and raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, but I want them to know at a specific, and I don't, I don't mean a moment and a date and a time, I mean I, I need their profession of the fact they come to know not only that they sin, but that they are sinners and that they need a Savior and, and, and come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and, and make that abundantly clear uh, in, in an understanding there's a before and after. That, that, that may be the biggest difference. The, what, what defines the before and after? And uh, I, I, it's a good discussion for us to have, but uh, I, that, that's why believers' baptism follows from our understanding of conversion, and thus our understanding of regenerate church membership, and that's what it means to be 
buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. It's, it's a very clear before and after conversion. Can I just add something? Just very quick. Yeah. The Bible is very clear that it says, David writes in Psalm 51, in sin did my mother conceive me. Uh, that does not mean that her conception was done out of wedlock. It means that David was a sinner in the womb of his mother. And Augustine well argued, if that's not the case, there would never be death in the womb. That there is that one that has been conceived in the womb is a sinner. And therefore, there can't even be... Um, a death before the delivery, because there's death in that womb. David goes on to say, it's either Psalm 57 or 58, that in, um, I came forth from my mother's womb speaking lies. So the only way to get into the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said to Nicodemus, is you must be born again that there was something desperately wrong about your first birth, that you were born in spiritual death. Uh, Ephesians 2 verse 1 makes that crystal clear. Um, no matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, that until you are born again, you are spiritually dead in trespasses and sin. No matter how many times you've been brought to church, no matter how much water's been sprinkled on you. You are separated from a holy God because of your sin. And the only way to enter into the kingdom of heaven, I want to say that one more time, the only way to enter into the kingdom of heaven is for you to be sovereignly, monergistically regenerated by the Spirit of God and given faith and repentance. I think we do a, um, a tremendous harm to evangelism and the preaching of the gospel to give children any thought that they are a Christian until they have actually entered into the kingdom of heaven. Now, I know there's a difference in opinion among us, but if, if we can't get that part right, then I think our evangelism is enormously hindered. Um, I'll never forget the night my daughter was converted. She rode in the car with me to church that night, and I was preaching John 17, verse 1. Father, the hour has come. Glorify the Son, that the Son may be glorified in you. As we are driving to church, I told her, you need to be born again. And I can't do that for you. And I'm the pastor of this church. You, as you hear me preach tonight, you need to ask and pray that God will act upon your soul and upon your heart. And I remember that night, we, she did not come back. I, I took our three sons home. My wife took her home. And she didn't come in until... They didn't come in until 10 o'clock that night, and I thought, oh, my goodness, now I'm going to have to go up to the bedroom, and this is going to be a huge, you know, parental night talking with my daughter, who, who had been very resistant at that time, not very resistant, but resistant to us. And she came in and walked into the den and said, Dad, I've, I've been born again. And we went upstairs and got her three brothers and brought them down to the den. And she said, I want to ask for you to forgive me for the way I've acted towards you, but I have been born again. If I had given her any hope that she was right with God until she was born again, I would have misrepresented the gospel to her. Now, as to the question in Acts 16, and you're a whole household, this is really interesting. For two consecutive years after I was in class with R.C., 
the entire class at the end of the semester left and I was left in the room one-on-one -on -one with R.C. And for two years in a row, he said, what do I have to do to get you to be a Presbyterian? <laughs> and I said, R.C., I would love to be a Presbyterian. You have better pulpits than we have. <laughs> so I literally, I stuck out my arm and I said, twist my arm. Make me a Presbyterian. I would love to be one. I seriously would. And he said, Acts 16. And I said, R.C., you, you didn't read the next verse. Everyone in that household believed in Jesus. I, I, I said, I would love to accept that, but this says they all believed in Jesus. Now, a one-year-old cannot believe in Jesus. A two-year-old cannot believe in Jesus. So is a one-year-old or a two-year-old lost if they die at one or two? Is that what you're saying? No. No, I think they are lost, but I do believe that one-year-old or that two-year-old does go to heaven. And we are left with <clears throat> an implication that is not directly stated in Scripture. But I do believe from David and from Job and from other passages that that infant does, God applies the grace of God as the implication that we would have to make, and that one does go to heaven. So I do believe that. Well, you see, I think that on a number of points we're agreed. We mustn't miss where we are agreed. I believe all our children are born in sin, as you articulated it. I believe all our children need to be regenerated sovereignly by the grace of God. Uh, I, think, I think the difference in some ways is this question of how we raise our children and whether I'm rather opposed to the notion that we put pressure on our children to have a specific experience and moment of conversion. Some of them will, and those who do, I rejoice in that. I rejoice in that. That's the way the, word, the Lord works in some of our children. But in others, there's a time they never know except of believing in, knowing, living for Jesus. And to say to them, you can't really be trusting Jesus because you never had a crisis experience, I, I don't think is, is accurate to the Scriptures. I, I think it is possible. Uh, I think, I believe with Luther that John the Baptist was regenerated in his mother's womb because he leapt for joy in the presence of Jesus in Elizabeth's womb. Well, then he's going to grow up as a regenerated person with faith all through his life and doesn't need a crisis experience. Go ahead, Al. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think we do need a crisis experience. I think that's what being born again means. I, that's what I hope and pray for in my children and in my grandchildren. I don't want it to be an artificial crisis. I don't want it to be an orchestrated crisis. And when you say a moment, I cannot tell you the moment when I became a Christian. I can tell you the moment when I was nine when I believe I came to know not only that I sinned, but that, that I am a sinner under the conviction of preaching. And I just desired Christ. The gospel was explained to me far more completely over the next several days. I can't point to a day. We used to have this stupid song that uh, used to be sung, you know, on a Monday, Jesus saved me. And people would stand up if they were saved on Monday. So, I, uh, you know, there's a sense in which I was saved on a Friday and on a Sunday. Uh, 2,000 years ago, but there's another sense in which I had to be born again, and I don't know when that happened exactly in a moment in time, but I know that I was a lost child who deserved nothing but hell, and then was saved by the grace and mercy of God, and I came to know the sweetness of the gospel of Christ. I came to know what it meant to be born again, and I don't believe there's going to be anyone in heaven who has not been born again, and I think Jesus made that just emphatically clear. In, in John chapter 3. I don't believe that John the Baptist was regenerated in his mother's womb. I do think he, he leapt with joy for Christ when he was in Christ's presence. And I want my children to do that too. But I want them to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and be born again. I think that's even more important. See, I knew it was going to take a while. <laughs>
And we've talked about this just internally, as in, and, and I've heard some of you remark on this publicly as well, is that we can have this conversation because we have a commitment to the authority of the Scriptures, and we can do it in fellowship with one another. And I think that's one of the, the wonders of Ligonier Ministries is the breadth uh, of perspective on certain issues, and yet a solid conviction. Um, I think it goes back to the large-heartedness of R.C. Sproul. And I, I, I rejoice that Ligonier while holding to the exclusivity of salvation in Christ alone, um, that R.C. Um, embraced me, embraced Al, and, and others. In fact, Ligonier ended up really in many ways being a haven and a refuge for so many Baptists to find truth. And, and I'm so grateful that R.C. was so secure in his relationship with the Lord, that he did not um, he did not keep us out, but allowed us uh, to have access to this ministry, and um, and I rejoice um, in that. Yeah, I just want to come back and affirm what Steve just wonderfully said, and I just want to remind us all that R.C. prompted this conversation orchestrated to make sure this conversation took place, even in the context of a Ligonier conference. And so we shouldn't be afraid to do this as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are, to make Chris's point, we're the last people on earth who can have an honest theological disagreement because we believe that truth matters and we're actually honoring the truth. We're honoring Christ and I believe we're honoring the purpose for which Ligonier Ministries was established and having this conversation, which I guarantee you will continue after this question time is over. Yeah, Chris, and just to add one more thing, um, there's the substance of the gospel and there's the sign of the gospel where we agree emphatically unto death is in the substance of the gospel. Uh, the difference would be in the sign and, and that's a totally different matter. I mean, I'll go to the stake and die for the substance of the gospel, even with my convictions. I don't know that I really want to die for the sign of the gospel, but I'll die for the substance of the gospel. Can I just, can I just add that I want to be clear that our position, my position, is not that baptism saves the baby, uh, but baptism is the sign of the covenant in which the child is already included, and I think that's what your children are holy means, and that as that child grows up, that child needs to be instructed in the meaning of baptism that that child will have faith in Christ. So the, the point that we are all agreed on, I think, is our children need to have faith in Christ. And um, that's what we need to raise them for. Would you thank our panelists this afternoon?